Hello, my name is Mike Lukic, and today I'm going to be going through a hand analysis with you. Specifically, I'm going to be looking at a spot from Poker Out Loud, the student edition. Uh, I'm going to be examining a spot from episode two, where Matt Berkey got into an interesting three bet pot situation with Chris Price. I'll play some clips from the hand in question within this video. Uh, but if you haven't done so already, I, I would highly recommend that you head over to the Solve for Why YouTube channel and watch this episode of Poker Out Loud and just Poker Out Loud in general. Um, I highly recommend uh, this series. Um, as a concept, I think it's great. It, it allows us to go one step beyond watching a regular po poker game. Uh, we can actually get inside someone's head and learn about their thought processes in real time to better deconstruct what they're thinking in the moment and understand why they chose the route that they did in actually playing the hand. Now I love hand and range analyses using solvers and that's what we're going to spend time looking at today. Uh, I think one it, it allows us to get a better sense for the equilibrium output of a situation, uh, which helps us develop a solid baseline strategy that we may be able to employ uh, within, or at least close to, within um, an in-game scenario. Uh, and number two, it helps us determine where there might be imbalances um, in different players or player pools um, that we can identify, which will help us better build an exploitative strategy uh, to actually take advantage of those uh, imbalances. Now, Poker Out Loud helps us better conduct these hand analyses using solvers. Um, as we'll get to shortly, using a solver to analyze a hand requires us to make a number of assumptions about things like those players' ranges, their strategic actions, and a number of other things. And as a result, we have to estimate a lot based on things like player profiles and pool tendencies. And it's hard for us not to inject a layer of our own biases into these inputs as well. Now, when we're watching Poker Out Loud, the players aren't giving us complete information. So they're not fully breaking down their ranges. Uh, but they are explaining their thought processes. And because of that, we're afforded more knowledge that will help us more accurately build all our solver inputs when we're actually setting up the sim. So today I'm going to focus on this specific hand at equilibrium, but I'm also going to apply some of the in-game analyses from both Matt and Chris to better model the scenario based on their in-game real-time observations. Now, before I actually dive into the hand, I, I want you guys to keep a few things in mind. And this might be obvious to some people, but I think it's really important to call out up front uh, because this gets lost sometimes. First, a solver output is only as good as its inputs. I think somehow solvers have this mystical aura around them in some circles. Uh, some people talk about them as if they're these clairvoyant tools that have completely solved the game, when in fact, they're just really powerful calculators that can run game simulations based on the inputs that we provide. So the greater the error in our inputs, the worse our solution will actually be. Which leads me into the second point right here, which is the deviations in some of these inputs can and will change the output. Um, now, this varies from sim to sim and situation to situation. Sometimes seemingly bigger changes won't really impact our EV very much. Um, and other times, very small changes can result in some fairly large shifts in both our expectation value and the overall strategy that's chosen by the solution. So I think it's always a really good idea to actually test a few variations in our inputs as we're developing these solves to better understand how sensitive our output is to the input assumptions. The third point here is that our solutions assume that both actors are playing unexploitably both on current and future streets. So unless I node lock a, a specific decision point, which we'll get into later, 
the solution is going to find the output where neither player can unilater unilaterally adjust its strategy to gain any more EV. But it also assumes that players are going to be playing perfectly on future streets as well. Uh, and that can lead to some assumptions uh, that can that may be faulty as we're actually looking at the outputs of, of, of these solutions. And then finally, I think it's it's important to note out that it's it's impossible or at least very, very difficult to perfectly validate a line with a solver. Um, again, I, I think solvers are incredibly valuable tools. I base a lot of the work that I do on them, um, but I think they should be used to confirm hypotheses and to give us insights into things like our frequencies, our, our, our ranged construction, and you know a number of other concepts what I don't think that they should be used for, which is unfortunately what I think a lot of people do use them for, is just confirming a very specific line for one hand. So with all of those disclaimers and with all that said in mind, let's actually just take a look at the hand. And before we actually dive into the solves or you know any replays of the hand, I want to put this all in one place. Uh, this is the hand that we're actually going to examine. So the hand in question is a 510 No Limit game played on Poker Out Loud in episode two. Uh, we had three players uh, voluntarily put money into the pot. Uh, that was uh, Chris Konvalinka, uh, who has a, uh, who's sitting on the button with a stack of uh, just over $2,900. Uh, Matt Berkey, who is in the small blind with a stack of $2,965. And Chris Price, who's in the big blind with a stack of $2,935. Uh, the action goes as follows. Uh, Chris Konvalinka raises preflop uh, from the button. He opens to $30 with uh, the Queen 8 of Diamonds. Uh, Berkey then three bets, three bets to 175 with Ace-10 offsuit uh, from the small blind, and Chris Price flat calls that with King-Queen offsuit uh, from the big blind, and Chris Konvalinka then folds the Queen-8 of diamonds uh, on the button. So we go to a flop with $380 in the middle, uh, for, and it comes a fairly dry board uh, of King-4-4 four, four rainbow. Berkey then checks and Chris Price decides to put in just over a half pot bet of $200 and Berkey calls. Uh, the turn with $780 in the pot is the three of clubs. Uh, Berkey checks, Chris Price uh, bets a little smaller this time uh, in relation to the pot. Uh, he bets 325 and Berkey calls. Uh, the river is the jack of diamonds with 1430 in the pot, Berkey checks. Uh, Chris Price then bets somewhere around 70-ish percent pot. He bets about $1,000, and Berkey makes the fold. So the first thing we'll have to do here is actually develop our assumptions and build out our tree. And the most co important component of this is to build our ranges. Now, this is going to be slightly more difficult for us as we're examining a 3-bet pot. Uh, than it would be if we were looking at a single raise pot. Uh, now, one of the main reasons for this is in a single raise pot formation, uh, the large majority of players are will open a linear range. And that means that uh, they're going to choose to raise its best hands from aces all the way to a certain point and then fold everything worse than that point. Now, while there certainly are deviations from player to player, uh, some players uh, open wider than others, we can usually fairly, with a fairly high degree of accuracy, um, estimate these somewhat well. And in addition, since our ranges at this point are in these single race pot scenarios are just generally so much wider uh, than they are in three bit pots, missing a combo here and there isn't actually going to impact our output that significantly. So we have a little bit more margin for error in those formations. Now in our three bit, three bit pot scenarios, our ranges are narrower and they can be split differently from player to player. And that means that you know, we're already going to have less hands in our range. But in addition, some of our players uh, can be choosing different strategies where they place certain hands in putting some of them in three bit ranges, putting others in calling ranges. And this makes estimating these ranges with no information really difficult to do um, and it makes it all the more important to run different sims uh, based on different types of ranges in which they may be taking to the flop. Now the good thing as mentioned above is that we do actually have some information based on their in-game analyses. So 
let's actually switch over to Poker Allied and listen to what Matt and Chris have to say about their construction before we actually go and build out their ranges. <laughs> Pretty clear open here. Probably going to open somewhere around 40%. Usually I would open more, but given that I have a tough opponent in the small blind. Okay, I have a uh, clear continue here with my hand. Uh, finally, I get the V-pip. Um, I like to three bet this hand more than call, I believe. Uh, I actually would start constructing my flat call range as far as offsuit broadblades go with the weaker ones. So I think I'd be more inclined to call like king 10, jack 10, queen 10, uh, queen jack, king jack, hands, hands of that uh, class, I suppose. Ace 10 stands to dominate a lot of Chris's opening range here. Um, and we're just gonna be pushing a fair amount of equity, even the times that he defends. It also shifts very naturally into a uh, five bet bluff, should he be choosing to four bet, and I think he's getting out of line. Uh, so I'm gonna choose a size here, a little bit more in the polar nature since I am out of position. I'm gonna go to 175. 175 is the bet. Um, okay. So, uh, Chris opens to 30. Matt, three bets to 175. Um, his bet is pulled. Uh, I think he's likely doing this with a lot of his uh, suited uh, wheel aces and a lot of the, the top end of his range. Um, I have blockers for the top end, so I think this is a, like typically would be a, a decent candidate to uh, call. I can't really see four betting here. Um, I believe Chris is relatively wide. If I flat here, I think that Chris is likely either going to come along with a wider part of his range, which I think I have a good chunk of dominated. Um, and uh, it, it, it almost seems like this is just a little too good of an opportunity to, to pass up the play in position against Matt as well. Um, I'm going to opt to call. Well, this is interesting. I was just going to say how facing this size I think that I can continue with my better performing hands, like jack-10 suited, 10-9 suited pairs. Given that queen-8 ranks relatively low, especially facing this big of a 3-bet, and knowing that Berkey has flats out of the small blind, if he was playing a binary strategy of strictly three betting or folding, then a four bet or appeal is a better option. But I think that he's constructing a mix. Up against a three bet and a cold call range, just ranks too low. So now that we've heard from both Matt and Chris, about their thought processes, let's take a second to examine what we know as we develop this tree. So we know that Berkey's going to have both a three bet and a calling range. We know that Ace 10 off is going to fit into his three bet range here. We also know that weaker offsuit broadways, so hands like King 10 off, Queen 10 off, Jack 10 off, uh, King Jack off, Queen Jack off are going to be fitting into his calling range. Uh, we don't necessarily know what else will fit into his calling range. He didn't really get into that, but we can make some assumptions uh, based off of that. Um, we also know that he may utilize Ace-10 off as a, a bluff in a polarized 5-bet range if it goes to Chris K and he 4-bets. Um, so, we can assume ace 10 off is the worst um, uh, offsuit ace in his range here. Um, 
we can also assume that he's going to have a somewhat capped, uh, robust calling range here as well, too. Now, Chris doesn't spend all, as much time diving into his range construction here. Uh, we do know, though, that he doesn't want to 4-bet king-queen off here. Um, so he includes king-queen off into a flat call range, and a lot of times we can pair king-queen off with hands like ace-jack off, um, you know, and some other hands like, you know, jacks and tens. Uh, so we can start to fill out what that flat call range might look like here. Um, we're also unsure about what his four bet range would look like here. And, you know, we can obviously make the assumption that, you know, super top end hands like aces, kings, ace, king, you know, some queens is going to be utilized in a four bet range. But we also don't know, you know, how much of it he'll retain actually as a trap in a cold call range. So while this doesn't give us all of the information, it actually does give us some more information to actually let us build out um, a decent ranges for both Matt and Chris. Now, as I dig into this a little bit more, I'm going to actually utilize uh, two tools for this analysis. Uh, and I'm going to look at both Flopzilla and GTO Plus. Now, I can certainly do all of this in PO Solver. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that PO Solver is, is a fantastic tool to be able to do so. And I utilize PO Solver fairly regularly for a lot of my uh, analyses. I actually, when I'm going through a single hand or a single range analysis, um, I tend to prefer GTO Plus uh, mainly because I like the UI better um, when I'm looking at a single hand. Um, and I also like the functionality of being able to pair it and link it with Flopzilla, which we'll demonstrate in a second as well, too. So let's take a look at these ranges within Flopzilla first and look at how they interact with one another before we actually build out our tree and uh, take a look at the solution. So we're going to start by looking at Berkey's range. And as you can see here, I the way I built Berkey's range was first, as he mentioned, he's going to be calling all of these offsuit Broadway hands right here. So I decided to put them all in his calling range. Um, now, he certainly can be mixing some of his better Broadway hands, his suited Broadway hands, into a calling range as well. I didn't choose to actually do that in this example here, mainly because Berkey's not necessarily going to be as incentivized to play a very polarized range here, meaning that he's going to be more linear from the small blind than he would be from the big blind in this scenario. So I think he's actually going to have a lot of his Broadway region in his three bit range. Um, so the fact that he's going to be building a flat call range with these weaker Broadway hands uh, makes sense to me, but that just tells me that he's probably going to be three betting the large majority of the time with the rest of his Broadway region. I have a lot of his high pairs in, in that three bet range. And then I filled it out with a little bit of a bottom end polarized uh, region of the, the suited wheel aces. And I believe, uh, you know, Chris Price mentioned this in his analysis as well. Um, now, Berkey is going to be a little wider than that. And, you know, I think he's going to have a fairly robust calling range, which might include some suited aces, um, some other suited hands, suited connectors, and then pairs. Um, but I think there's a portion of those cusp hands, so you know, these suited nines, you know, some of these kind of middle pairs and middle suited connectors that he may decide in game to three bet, or he may decide to actually uh, just call. So I, I weighted these hands in the middle here at uh, 50% uh, weighting, with the other 50% being flat calls in his flat calling range. So overall, this range gives him a uh, about 158 combos. Um, a half a combo because we're weighting some of these hands. Um, and that's about 13% of his range. Now you can see over here on the right, 
based on this equity matrix, uh, Berkey does have a lot of kings, and he ha obviously has the aces, kings, ace, king. So he's going to have, and he has ace four suited here, so he's going to have a fair amount of hands that actually do have a, a lot of equity. And then he's going to have, you know, some other hands, so, you know, these other broadways that don't necessarily hit the aces, or sorry, they hit, hit the king, and, you know, some of these lower pairs and lower suited connectors that are just going to have far worse equity. Now, Chris Price, his hand, his range is a little bit harder to actually um, analyze, uh, mainly because a lot of times you don't necessarily see flat call ranges for a three bet, um, or cold call ranges for a three bet here. In this situation, especially with a button open and a small blind uh, three bet, a lot of players are going to take a four bet or fold strategy. Uh, which is fine, and that's you know a fine strategy too. But I'm sure you can also build out a fairly robust and and good calling range as well too. So taking a look at Chris's range here, um, what I did here was uh, first building off of the fact that he does have king queen off in full combos here. Um, so based on the fact that he has king queen off, I also assumed that he would have ace jack off and jacks and tens as they tend to play fairly synonymously with king-queen off. Um, I gave him all of eight, the ace-queen combos, and then I stayed fairly snug with Chris's uh, cold call range, and I think that that's actually going to be a fairly good assumption here. Um, I don't see Chris just floating wild, uh, wild, uh, widely. Excuse me. I don't see him floating widely uh, versus Berkey, uh, versus Berkey's three bet here without necessarily closing the action. Meaning that Chris Konvalinka, if he does flat, uh, can come back over the top. And if Chris is too wide, he's not going to be able to defend. Even if you know Chris is flatting a hand like King Jack suited, which is fairly high up in his range right here, he's not going to be able to defend to a four bet if that comes through. So I have Chris here playing you know this tight range of hands um i have him playing half of eights he might i think this is around the cutoff eights or sevens where he might actually start folding um for queens i have him playing half of queens as a call the other half being a four bet um ace queen suited half as a call the other half as a four bet and then some of these kind of worse suited broadway hands might be half as a call and half as a fold and then finally i i did not include any aces kings Ace King off or Ace King suited, which may or may not be the best assumption, but uh, you know, again, that's kind of the first range with which I'm working. Now, when I look at both of these two ranges, we see that Berkey has a slight range advantage, so he's has about 52% equity, um, where uh, Chris Price has 48% uh, equity, which honestly was somewhat surprising to me. Um, I, I expected Berkey to be higher, uh, given the fact that he does have aces kings and ace king and ace four suited uh, but Berkey's range is also going to be a little bit wider whereas Chris is much more focused he doesn't have a lot of those Broadway hands that just miss he's much more focused on uh, pairs in his range um, I think it's actually very telling though when you actually look at this graph here and this equity graph and I'm going to look at Berkey's first you can see these two lines and the dark blue line is is Berkey's right now and then the light green that's a little faded is uh is Chris Price's. Um, I love looking at these. They're they're called equity graphs. Um, they're a really great. Uh, I first read about them in uh, Will Tipton's book, and they're a really great way of visualizing how our range is interacting with our opponent's range. And as you can see here, while we do have a slight equity edge, and you know, kind of as you look towards the bottom half of our range it's going to run somewhat in parallel or symmetrical to Chris Price's range. Where we get the huge edge is that we have we have the top hands and he doesn't. So hands like uh, our kings, our aces, ace four suited, ace king, uh, Chris Price doesn't have those hands. And, those, and that just means that uh, when we look and see an equity graph that has a shape like this, is we're going to be able to get to polarization with a portion of our range. Um, now it's definitely going to be the top end and we're going to have to find bluffs that fit the bottom end. Whether ace 10 off is one of those bluffs or not, uh, that remains to be seen. But uh, it does show us that we're able to uh, uh, build some level of polarization 
um, or get to some level of polarization within this hand, with some hands uh, of our range, in our range. Now, the other thing I wanted to look at here is, well, we made this assumption here that Chris Price is, is not going to retain uh, the top end of his range, but he might. So I built this out looking at a secondary component here too. So I looked at this range as well with keeping a quarter of aces, kings, and ace, king in Chris Price's range. So he decided to keep a quarter of this in his flat call range and the other three quarters of which he still four bets. Um, I also shifted ace queen suited and pocket queens into uh, flatting 75% of the time and uh, only four betting 25% of the time. And the rest of the range stays exactly the same. And what we see here is actually this shifts the equity slightly into Chris Price's favor. So something, even something as small as just retaining some of these, these nut hands within our range, it can shift our overall equity mix somewhat significantly here. It brings it back into our favor. Um, when I look at the equity graph, we still see this effect that Berkey is going to have more of these top end hands. And again, that makes sense. We're going to have all the kings, um, all the aces, all of the ace king, and then ace four suited while Chris Price does not. Uh, but it closes the gap somewhat. So um, Berkey's path to polarization is going to be very much, uh, it's going to be very aligned to whether Chris has these hands or not. And we're going to look at both of those in a solver as well. So we've had a chance to look at uh, both of these ranges. And then, and you know, Chris, this, this range, this flat call range is about 7.8% of hands. And the other flat call range is about 7.1% of hands. So again, Chris Price has a very tight and uh, narrow range, and which may, which is somewhat capped, maybe very capped, um, where Berkey has a bit of a wider range here, um, but it's mostly uh, top end, uh, a little polarized, but, but, but very heavily weighted towards the top end linear component of that. So now that we've defined both of these ranges, uh, we have this great function, this tool, where we can actually export these, hand, these hands or these uh, setups into GTO Plus and actually build out a tree. So I've set up our tree and we're going to look at what it looks like in GTO Plus. But first I actually wanted to share the configuration of the tree in case anyone wanted to replicate themselves. So I put our ranges in and the first one here is this is the scenario where Chris Price does four bet aces, kings and ace king in full, combo, in full combos preflop. So he doesn't have those in his range. Uh, Berkey is the out-of-position out player, and Chris Price is the in-position player. Uh, as you see here, our starting pot is $380. Uh, the effective stacks are just under $2,800. Um, for some of the options that I, I, I gave the solver, so our default bet is two-thirds pot, but that's not going to come up as often, um, considering that I gave the solver some more detailed options for flop, turn, and river. Um, on the flop, I gave both players a small bet and a large bet, so a one-third pot bet and a two-thirds pot bet. On the turn, I gave it a small bet, a medium bet, and a large bet, so uh, one-third pot, three-quarters pot, and 1.25x uh, over bet. And then on the river, I gave both players uh, the one-third pot, the three-quarters pot, the 1.25x pot, and then uh, a 200% pot, so a 2x pot bet on the river. Uh, and so both players have those same bet options. Uh, for check raises, uh, I change them slightly. So on the flop, if Berkey chooses, ch chooses a check raise, I have him check raising to 4x, uh, the size that uh, Chris Pe Price bets. Uh, on the turn and river, I have him check raising to 3.25x, uh, the, si the bet sizing. Uh, for Chris Price, because he's in position, I actually have these these sizings as a little bit smaller. So if Berkey leads, uh, Chris Price would be raising to 3x. Um, and on the turn and river, he would be raising to 2.75x. So um, once we put all of this together, we can actually build a tree and run the solver, which I have already done, and actually take a look at the solve. So the first solve here is for the situation where Chris Price does not have the top end hands in his range. And 
when I actually look at these solves, the first thing I always look at is our EV. So in this case here, Berkey's EV is uh, just over $257. And, and Chris Price's EV, which is in that hover box, is uh, just over $122. So Berkey ha is earning uh, over two thirds of the pot in EV, uh, which is a lot, uh, especially when you can see that uh, his equity share of the pot is only about 52%. So Berkey is over realizing his equity on this flop uh, very, very massively, um, which is uh, definitely fairly significant considering the fact that uh, if you recall from uh, one of my previous posts, um, equity realization is much, much, much more difficult out of position. Uh, so when you're in position, it's much easier to realize equity. Um, and when you're out of position, it's much more difficult to realize equity because you're out of position and you don't have that positional advantage. And the fact that Berkey can over-realize his equity at such a large um, percentage uh, while out of position is just, that goes to show how much of an impact having these top end hands, uh, um, aces, kings, ace, king, ace, king suited, and ace four suited, where Chris Price does not have any one of these hands. Um, just having those hands in our range uh, where Chris Price does not, that really drives a lot of the action in this hand. And you can see that through uh, the strategic actions that the solver chooses to take. So uh, the way this is set up is, according to this legend here, the dark blue is the two-thirds pot bet, the light pink here is the one-third pot bet, and then the green is checking. Uh, there's not a lot of checking going on. So the, the exact freak, uh, breakdown is up here, but um, according at equilibrium, Berkey's only checking about 18% of his range. Uh, and the majority of his range, actually, over 50% of it, and is uh, actually betting the larger size in, which was surprising to me because a lot of times when we do have such a large range advantage and we're betting virtually all of our range, uh, we're going to choose a smaller sizing. But when the advantage we have is significant enough or as, as significant as this, uh, the solver is just going to start trying to pile in money with that, um, with that range advantage. So, um, so in this case here, uh, um, uh, a lot of our hands are choosing to bet this uh, two-thirds pot sizing. So our aces, our ace king, our ace king suited. Um, some of our best bluffs, which are you know these uh, queen jack, queen ten, jack ten hands, specifically the ones with the backdoor uh, flush draw. Um, the reason these are great bluffs are uh, one, they can turn really good equity. So they all can turn uh, a flush draw. They all can turn uh, some type of straight draw. Um, but they also have the, the double effect of double blocking uh, some of Chris Price's best uh, bluff catching hands. So his best hands in his range, King Jack, uh, King Queen, and uh, King Ten, if he has it in his range. Uh, the fact that um, if having all these three uh, combos in our hands uh, can block hands that Chris has in his range, uh, making it much more likely that he uh, cannot call us um, with, with, with a hand. So it's choosing this large sizing with some of these hands, and then some of the other hands where we really lock up the board, like pocket kings or um, hands that are a little bit less vulnerable. So hands like you know ace four suited, um, and you know maybe some of these other kind of weaker king hands. Uh, it's going to be betting a, the smaller size for that too. Uh, one thing we really could do in this situation here is is Berkey really could, if he wanted to, choose to just take a simplified bet all strategy and choose somewhere in the um, you know 40 to 50 percent pot range so maybe 175 to 200 in that range right there um, maybe 150 to 200 and just bet everything in his range and I would be willing to bet that the EV does not change that much at all um, but uh, you know as we can when we look at our individual combos here Ace 10 really does not perform uh, that. Um, uh, it performs fine in any of the different uh, options here. So we can look actually at the EVs of those different uh, hands in the breakdown here. And you know our hand here specifically, uh, the Ace of Clubs and uh, 10 of Spades, uh, it could do anything. So the EV breakdown of all of these, it's the, the overall EV for this hand is 
uh, 29, just a little over, a little over $29. Um, it's not that big of a difference whether we wanted to actually bet it or um, actually check it here. So Berkey really could choose either option here. Um, choosing a check in this spot is fine. So he does choose a check and take, let's take a look at what Chris Price's options are. So Chris Price's hand, uh, his range is much more condensed. It's also very bounded. So what I mean by that is he does not have any top end hands and really King Queen, which is the hand that he actually has, is the best hand that he is going to have in his range. Um, I guess you could say that King Queen suited with the back door. So King Queen of Clubs and King Queen of Diamonds are, are, are probably the two best hands that he ha can have in his range. Uh, but overall, King Queen is the best hands that he can have in his range. The worst hands that he has in his range are uh, like 10-9 suited, Jack-10 suited, Queen-Jack, Queen-10, um, some of these offsuit suited hands. Uh, but he doesn't have a lot of those, right? So it's, it's, it's not a range that is... Um, it doesn't have, you know, super low equity hands, um, other than, you know, really the, uh, like the, the low suited connectors here, but it doesn't really have a lot of the high equity hands as well either. Um, as we can see here, Chris really could do either. Um, he could uh, bet King Queen, which he does, or he could check King Queen. Um, you can make a really good argument that uh, because Berkey has aces, kings, Ace King suited. He may very well play a check line with with pocket kings here. Um, so he could have some traps in his range. So you can make a very good argument that this king queen hand plays a lot easier um, if Chris Price just checks it back on the flop and then makes it a two street game. Uh, if Berkey then checks again, Chris Price can very comfortably uh, get two streets of value. Uh, if uh, Berkey starts betting out on turns, Chris Price can very comfortably call down two streets. Uh, the game just plays a heck of a lot easier. Um, if he bets out and gets check raised, he's put in a really difficult spot with King Queen here, um, particularly because it's the best hand in his range. And if he's folding the best hand in his range, he's folding his entire range here too. So you know, there's a good argument to be made that King Queen here is it could be a two street hand and. Um, he might be best served by uh, taking a check back line in the flop, but a, a bet on the flop is absolutely fine as well. And we can see here just from the EV that uh, bets and checks are really very equal. and the, the solver mixes them both accordingly. So he does choose the bet. And, you know, when he bets the large sizing, we can see that ace 10 off is a fold in full combos. Um, when he chooses the small sizing here, uh, there's actually some calls here. And um, so ace 10 off can be a, a call, it can be a fold. And when we actually look at some of the EVs for ace 10 off, it's the, full, the, the EV of folding is zero. And the EV of calling is either slightly positive or slightly negative. And, you know, some of this could just be the um, solver didn't run down to you know full 100% accuracy, but um, really it's just a close decision here. And you know Berkey's right that it's it's a really close spot here on the flop, and he really could go either way. Um, the solver probably leans fold in this spot here, uh, but uh, Berkey can definitely call if he thinks that uh, Chris Price is betting too much, or if he thinks that Chris Price is going to be making errors on future streets. So uh, a call is totally fine and. Um, we can see, uh, you know, future streets uh, accordingly. Uh, the one thing I actually I wanted to look at before we start diving into future streets and before we start looking at node locking is um, how does this actually look like when he retains some of the top end hands in his range? So I have the same exact solve, and uh, this is the range where uh, Chris Price actually does retain some of his top end hands. And you actually see one, our EV drops from that, uh, 257 mark to 215. So it drops uh, fairly substantially. Um, and that again, that's really because Chris Price is going to have more of these top end hands in his range. You'll also see that we're checking a lot more now. So uh, instead of checking only about you know 18% of our range, now we're checking almost half of our range. And um, some of the hands 
in which we you know may have been betting in full coverage before or m betting mostly before so we were mostly betting ace 10 or ace jack before now we're mostly checking with them and again that's because chris price is going to have some stronger hands in his range and it's really as simple as that in that spot um if he does check in this spot here uh chris price is faced with somewhat similar um options here and he can now he does have again these top end hands that he can now obviously be betting with um, what i do find interesting about this is it never really chooses the larger sizing um in, in this spot here it's still choosing the, the smaller sizing here and again i do think that's because you know even though chris price does have you know some of these hands he doesn't have them in full coverage and berkey does and berkey definitely could play a check raise line or a check call line with with those best hands in his range um King Queen, I think, is in a similar spot here again, where it could bet, it could check. Um, it's neither is, um, I, don't know, I have that on uh, the combos, but neither is uh, particularly uh, much better than the other. So um, really, Chris Price can't really make too big a mistake here in this spot. Um, you know, with King Queen, uh, it, it really could function in both as a check or a, um, a bet. Um, if he does choose to bet here, and I'll choose the smaller sizing um berkey's hand is is it again it can go slightly either way um i i think it probably plays a little bit better here as a fold in this spot here when chris price has better hands so um when uh when we get to this spot here and chris price does have the better hands in his range so he not only just has the you know king queen king jack king 10 uh, in his range, but he also has pocket kings, ace king, um, and aces. Uh, Berkey's just going to be better off uh, letting ace ten and letting ace jack go, as well as some of his kind of weaker, um, you know, suited hands here, and hanging on uh, for at least one street with hands that he does have uh, that uh, are um, currently better. So you know, any of his pocket pairs that he has right here, he has a lot of kings in this spot here. And you know, if he's looking for ace highs, ace, he does have ace queen and full combos too, uh, which are going to be better than ace jack and ace 10 in this spot as well too. So the last thing I wanna do actually here is take a look at a simplified version in equilibrium. And I actually wanna use the bet sizings that uh, both Berkey and Chris Price used in this example um, and look at what the equilibrium looks like for that. Uh, before we actually hear some of Berkey and Chris's comments uh, to try to customize a tree a little bit more to uh, break down the decisions that are made. So we can go over to the next tree, which uh, I think we can, the first conclusion that we can make here in this spot here is uh, if Chris Price does retain aces, kings, ace, king in this, um, in, in, in full coverage, or at least in, even in partial coverage, I think Berkey has a fold on the flop with ace 10. I think it's just not going to continue well enough. And um, yes, he, his EV, the EV is probably not going to be much different between a check call and a check fold on the flop, but he's going to be relying, have to rely on Chris Price to have to make some mistakes. Um, and that's gonna be hard to do when Chris Price has a really s narrow range and he's playing in position. If Berkey were in position, it's it's a lot easier to float and uh, let Chris Price uh, give up initiative um, out of position and, and then Berkey potentially could take it away. Trying to play that pot out of position and take, uh, and somehow then, you know, take the pot away from him later on is just gonna be very difficult. So here is the scenario um, if we actually simplify this. So I, I broke this down and, and just hedged and gave Berkey uh, one sizing on the flop. So uh, just a little under half pot. Um, if he was betting everything uh, he for one sizing, I gave him about a 45% pot bet, so 175. Um, as you see here, the breakdown is really not much different. It has him betting a little bit more actually in this case here, 84% of range. And you can see here again that ace 10 really can play as a bet or a check in this spot here too. Um, just like last time uh, for Chris Price, you know, with his $200 bet, um, which is what he actually bets, uh, he can only really bet this about 28% of the time. And, you know, again, we see some of the similar conclusions that we made here, which is 
Um, he just has to check a lot. And uh, some of those checks are going to include hands like King Queen and King Jack and King Ten, even though these are his best hands, because he has nothing else to protect them. And uh, again, Berkey can put him in the cage uh, by check raising. And you know, King Queen is not really happy. You know, even as his best hand, King Queen is not really happy facing a check raise in this spot here. Um, he has queens, jacks, tens, nines, eights, but you know, those are really not as incentivized uh, to bet on the flop. I think they're they're more in realization mode and are going to be looking to uh, get to showdown. Um, and the solver shows that as well here too. And then some of his uh, you know backdoor hands like queen, jack, queen, ten, jack, ten, which Berkey did mention. Um, are betting at some small frequency as well here too. Um, when he does bet, um, Berkey uh, has a, it looks to be again, you know, similar stories. It looks to be that he should be folding um, ace 10, um, ace jack, maybe a little bit less frequently, um, and then calling in full combos at uh, ace queen, um, as well as folding all of these uh, suited connectors that he has here. And I'll do it in full coverage so you can see the 100%. Um, so, Folding ace jack, folding ace ten, folding some of these suited connectors, and then continuing with really any pairs or uh, ace highs, with some check raises that are actually mixed into the mix here as well too. So, this is what everything looks like at equilibrium, and I think the the main conclusions that we can make here at, at equilibrium are uh, one, you know, as we mentioned, if Chris Price does have top end uh, coverage in his range, uh, Berkey should lean fold on the flop. Uh, check fold in the flop with ace 10. Um, or I guess the other thing I could say is that Berkey really could just dis decide to lead ace 10 and everything else if he wanted to on the flop as, instead of check raising, but or instead of check calling. Um, checking is, is absolutely fine. Uh, but uh, if he is checking and facing a bet, uh, folding is probably best here uh, with ace 10. Um, for Chris Price's uh, case, it looks like uh, King Queen is a fine bet on the flop, um, but uh, given the uh, given Berkey's uh, range and top end advantage, he may be better off served uh, checking on the flop and pushing things through to the turn as a two street game. Um, given that he likely does not have a three street hand, which Berkey mentions in, in, in the video. So you know, I, I've teased the video a couple times already, uh, but I, I think it's useful to actually listen to what Berkey and Chris have to say. And from there, what I'd like to do to finish up this video is actually customize and node lock a few of these uh, scenarios to identify the thresholds for where maybe Berkey should be playing um, Ace-10 a little differently or uh, Chris Price should be playing King-Queen a little bit differently um, and just kind of understand the sensitivities to some of the assumptions that they're making um, in game. So let's just take a second and, and, and look at uh, Berkey and Chris's uh, insights into their hands during Poker Out Loud. Okay, uh, so the cold call by Chris here is, I wouldn't go so far as to say peculiar. I would just say more so that it's complicated. So if he's four betting, um, which is very reasonable, he will be constructed in a very polar manner. It's difficult to work in a linear four bet here. Uh, what I mean by that is to take your middling equity hands like king, queen, pocket nines, pocket eights, something to that nature, and begin cold fouring. Now, that's not to say that's not profitable. Of course it is. It's certainly making money versus a button open in a small blind three bet. Um, so he's kind of creating a situation where he's uh, delaying the resistance point of the hand. Um, so rather than basically making all the difficult decisions pre-flop, he's allowing himself the ability to utilize a positional edge should Chris fold, which is what happened, to um, kind of complicate the hand for me now moving forward post. Uh, 
Uh, I don't mind working this in sometimes. Obviously, he is a student, so I kind of have an idea how he's going to begin constructing. I think that uh, I think he probably has less coverage on the king than would be necessarily perceived. Uh, as far as four bet bluffs go, king queen and like hands like king jack are kind of the nuts for that. So I do expect him to have hands like jacks, nines, eights, sevens, uh, and then perhaps like some ace x that I dominate and some ace x that dominates me. So like some ace jack, ace queen, but also like some ace seven through ace nine suited type holdings. Um, I don't think I get a C bet through here and my hand isn't gonna barrel very well, but it is like the bottom of my bluff catching range. So I think I can very comfortably start off with a check. I do have kings full in my range. He's less likely to. Uh, so this flop should go check check a lot and we should be able to then play future streets accordingly. Okay, so Matt checks. Um, I think that uh this is kind of the, the plan that we started with was positional advantage with our call. Makes it really tough for Gris to uh, call pre um, with, uh, with a three bet and a cold call range. Um, we uh, flop, of course, uh, I think what is you know, pretty obviously the best hand in the spot. I'm seeing Matt show up here with a lot of his three bets probably being connectors of some sort on the um, on the high to mid end, um, as well as some pairs, um, sevens, eights, uh, things like that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, leave out on this. I'm going to bet uh, 200. 200? All right, so Chris is going to choose a size of 200 into 380. Um, this is a little bit on the larger side. It, it's honestly fine for what's effectively a four bet pot, but uh, he doesn't really have three street hands here very often. Of course, he could be trapping with aces, kings, sometimes ace king, but we block the aces and the ace king. Um, king's full isn't really incentivized to go big. He does, of course, want to start protecting hands like queens, jacks, tens, nines, eights, if uh, they're in his range. But I think he can do so for a smaller size, since I also have similar hands in my range. Um, again, he very well could have king, queen, uh, but I don't really think that that serves him as a three street hand, uh, particularly when I do have the viability here to both check raise and just be sticky through multiple streets. So I'm actually gonna continue through a call um, Dependent upon the turn texture, I may bluff catch twice. I don't really think I'm going to be in a situation to turn this hand into a bluff. Uh, I don't really think he has a lot of bluffing candidates outside of like exactly queen jack and maybe uh, he has hands like jack 10 of diamonds. Um, I think I have the 10 of clubs. So jack 10 of diamonds, jack 10 of, no, I have the 10 of spades. So. He could have jack 10 of diamonds, jack 10 of clubs. Uh, he could have queen 10 of diamonds, queen 10 of clubs, queen jack in all three suits. Uh, and then he might also just even bet the queen jack of hearts here to try to stab and win. Uh, I have a very clear call, I think, uh, as the bulk of my range would want to choose. And then dependent upon turns, I may continue through another call. Okay, so um, Matt's call, uh, he's in realization, I believe, so he's still trying to, he, he has some equity in this hand, um, and he's uh, uh, obviously, um, we're moving towards showdown. Um, I have a couple options here. I think that um, in retrospect, I probably bet a little bit big uh, with my particular holding on uh, this flop. Um, I do want to continue because I think that uh, I'm able to capitalize on my equity um, that I have here. Um, I think that the possibility he's 
uh, tripped up on this type of board, and uh, and if he has any like that, it, it's. I believe he's he thinks that he's uh, maybe has some hands that are um, blocking some of uh, some of my holdings in this particular holding. Um, it's. I've taken kind of a weird line with uh, Queen King, but I think that uh, another bet on this turn is likely going to either see, I think it will see either, um, I think it will see a fold to be honest. Uh, and I, I want to keep ranges relatively wide because I'd like to get, uh, I'd like to get a, a little more value. Um, so I'm going to bet a little bit smaller um, sizing, but I'm still going to bet. Um, with the intent of getting uh, another street after this. So, learn that 325. 325. Alright, I really like the sizing by Chris. Um, he doesn't really have a plethora of bluffs available. So, uh, I was going to have a real decision if he had chosen to bet like pot. And that decision basically would be how imbalanced is he? Um, would he be betting pot with his value hands trying to rep that he's bluffing at too high of a frequency? Or would he only be betting pot with his actual bluffs? Um, I think I would have just arrived that he would have been trying to level me and ultimately I would have folded. Uh, when he chooses a size of 325, which is a little under half pot, um, it allows him to be betting more hands. He could technically still be betting a hand like queens or jacks, though I think it's largely a mistake, at least without the queen of clubs in hand. Uh, reducing my king-queen of club combinations is probably pretty critical. Uh, this is close. I do have the ace of clubs, which means that he has no nut flush draws here. His logical bluffs are going to be Queen 10 of clubs, Queen Jack of clubs, Jack 10 of clubs, 10 9 of clubs, um, and so on, depending on how wide he's cold calling with uh, suited connectors. So we're looking at something in the range of four to eight logical bluffs. Uh, his value hands are going to be, let's give him half the combos of aces, so one and a half. Uh, same thing with kings for three total combos. Uh, um, we'll say like half the ace king. So maybe uh, let's, let's give him like five or six combos of ace king. Um, four nine. And then he could be making some accidental value bets with like ace jack clubs. No, I have the ace club, sorry. I guess with just like ace jack high, ace queen high. But I'm not really sure what he would be targeting at that point. He also could be making some thin value bets with like queens or jacks. So we'll give him like half combos of each of those for another six combos. So we're looking at something in the neighborhood of like 15 combinations of value versus four to eight combos of bluffs. So he's at like a three to one or two to one uh, value to bluff combo and I'm getting laid pretty much the exact right price for this. Um, I think I'm going to have to continue one more and I may ultimately have to call on a non-club, non-queen, non-jack river. So now that we've had a chance to see Berkey and Chris's thought process in the moment, I wanted to node lock a few things and look at a few extreme scenarios uh, just to see the thresholds for which, for how the solver might react if one player was taking a specific strategy. So a lot of times this can actually be looked at as a max exploit strategy. So you know if we knew that one player was uh, taking a strategy with with some degree of certainty, how can we best exploit it? Uh, so. The first thing I, I want to look at is, um, from Berkey's perspective, well, what if Chris is betting too much on the flop, and you know, betting, you know, and that could be including both value and bluffs. Um, and then the second one would be, what if he's 
not necessarily betting value as much, but he's betting more bluffs than he is value. So uh, what I've done is I've actually node locked uh, Chris Chris's uh, decision point here. And I've said that, okay, Chris is actually going to be betting all of his king queens, which is his best hand. He's going to bet about 75% of his king jacks, 50% of his king tens, um, and then 50% of his uh, queens and jacks, 75% of his tens, nines, and eights. So um, essentially, uh, king queens are his best hand, so I'm going to bet that in full. Um, king jack, king ten, it's going to slightly decrease in value, so we're going to slightly decrease the frequency at which he might be betting. Um, and then for these other pocket pairs, which he may be betting more for protection and or denial purposes, uh, he's more incentivized to bet the lower ones. Uh, so Berkey can't necessarily hit an overcard with a hand like queen jack. Uh, then he is to bet hands like queens and jacks here too. So I have him betting queens and jacks a little less frequently than tens, nines, and eights. Um, for his bluffs, I have him betting in full frequency uh, anything with a backdoor draw. So I have anything with a two card backdoor uh, flush draw, he is uh, betting in full frequency. Um, uh, so uh, queen jack suited, queen ten suited, jack ten suited, ten nine suited and the ace-queen, ace-jack, ace-ten suited hands. So this results in Chris betting about 56% of the time, which as we saw from before, that's just clearly betting too much. Uh, and Berkey's response to this actually is to just check all on the flop. And you actually see his EV even goes even higher. So his EV here is $277 um, just by take, taking this check all strategy. And when Chris does bet, Berkey can check raise fairly aggressively. So he can check raise uh, you know, really all of his hands that center around the king here. So um, anything king, queen, or better, which we know is better than any hands that uh, Chris Price has in his range. He can then check raise also queens and queen jack because that uh, blocks all of his, uh, that, that blocks Chris Price's king, queen, which is his best hands. Um, he can check raise the ace four uh, suited hand, um, as well as the ace five wheels with the back door uh, flush draws. But what is he doing with ace 10? He's still folding this. And actually in this spot here, uh, you can see it's actually fairly a, a clear fold in this spot here. Um, uh, the EVs of folding are zero, whereas the EV of calling is um, pretty significantly negative. So, you know, when Chris Price is actually betting a lot of his value, Berkey should definitely be erring towards uh, folding on ace 10 off. The other scenario I actually want to look at here in this spot is what happens if Chris Price is over bluffing? So similarly, what I did here in this spot was I actually chose to keep him betting all of his backdoor flush draws. So he's still betting all of the backdoor flush draws in full frequency, but now he's betting much less value. So uh, king, queen, king, jack, king, 10, um, he's only betting those in half combos. And then queens through eights, he's not betting those at all. And that may or may not be realistic, but it's again, the other end of the extreme spectrum. Uh, one from the EV here, it's actually better for Chris Price. So. The EV goes down to about $252, um, which is actually lower than overall equilibrium. So, you know, in this spot here, uh, Chris Price is actually doing fairly well by actually taking this strategy compared to just an overall equilibrium strategy. Um, uh, Berkey is responding by checking most of his range to start. Um, and then when Chris Price comes in with the bet, uh, Berkey can defend fairly widely, wild, widely um, through both high frequency check raises and uh, check calls. Now, as you see, Ace-10, interestingly enough, becomes a mix. And when you actually look at this, I found this fascinating here, is that the big delineate, the distinguisher of whether Berkey should be continuing or not is if he has a heart in his hand or not. And what's significant about that is that Chris Price the hands in which Chris Price is going, are, is going to be betting here are hands with back doors. So if he's over bluffing here in this spot here, he's going to be over bluffing likely with hands 
that have that have two spades, two diamonds, or two clubs. Um, he's not going to be over bluffing with hands that have two hearts. So um, when we have a heart, uh, he is. It is more likely that Chris Price has one of those backdoor hands. When we do not have a heart and we have one of the other uh, suits, so hands that contain diamonds, clubs, or spades, um, that means Chris Price is less likely to have uh, those specific uh, bluff combos in his range um, or in his in his hand at the given time. And he's, that means he's, he's more likely to have uh, you know, a, a value hands like King Queen, like King Jack in this spot here. So, you know, again, if Berkey does feel like Chris Price is over bluffing, um, because he did mention that in, in his uh, in his thought process that uh, Chris Price may be doing this with um, those Queen Jack, Queen Ten, um, Jack Ten suited type hands, or any other of those hands that have uh, backdoor flush draws. So. If that is a strong read that Berkey has, um, he's much more, uh, he's much better off having a heart in his hand when he chooses a check call route than he would be to um, have, uh, to not have a heart in his hand. The last thing I wanna look at here is going back to the equilibrium, and this is the equilibrium simplified solve here, is what do turns look like? So. We check from Berkey's perspective, uh, Chris Price bets, and Berkey calls. And the turn is the three of clubs. Now first looking at the turn report, um, from Berkey's perspective, the three of clubs should be a fairly good card for us. And really the only bad cards for us are um, Queen Jacks and surprisingly Aces here are, are bad calls for us. But again, we have to remember this is from the uh, check call line perspective. Um, but when the three of clubs does come, uh, Berkey is doesn't have a ton in his range left, but he's uh, checking most of his range. Um, Chris Price is then betting most of his range here, and then when he does the H10 that he does have, and I'll just go in full here, the H10 that he does have in his range is a fairly clear fold in this spot here. Um, the EV of calling is. Um, for Berkey's uh, hand is it, it's going to be in the you know minus eighty to one hundred dollar range, and it actually is. Um, we don't have the uh, Berkey specific combo in this range at equilibrium here because it just folds all of those um, either folds either check folds everything or leads out on the flop, so none of those specific combos actually make it to this node of the game tree. But you see all of the other Ace Ten offs here um, have uh, really negative. Uh, EVs for uh, the calling tree um, and then zero for the fold. So uh, really what this just tells us is that um, the, the flop call, uh, the flop check call line, it's close. Uh, the EVs are, are somewhat uh, similar to both check call and check fold through the checking game tree. Uh, but uh, once we get to the turn, um, we see here the betting range for uh, Chris Price, and he's going to funnel down a little bit more. So some of the hands that he you know, bet on the flop um, is not are not going to necessarily continue betting on the turn. So um, you know hands that don't necessarily pick up a backdoor. So the ones that have clubs, yes, they're going to continue betting. But um, the you know some of his other hands, uh, some of his pocket pairs, um, it's ambitious to expect them to, to continue betting. Um, it's ambitious to expect um, hands like, uh, um, you know, his suited hands that don't pick up a backdoor to continue betting. Uh, so the majority of the hands that do continue betting um, are uh, kings um, and backdoor hands. And some of those backdoor hands even beat us. So you know, he could have backdoor hands like ace-jack and um, or even ace-queen in this spot here. And... Uh, that beats us, and um, it just—it's—it's it's a tough spot to actually put us into a, a check call spot. So I think the turn check call is um, probably uh, uh, not that great, whereas the flop check call is uh, um, pretty close either way. So we've took a look at Berkey's perspective. I, I want to finish up the video by actually um, looking at Chris Price's perspective, and then um, we'll wrap up with some.
uh, final takeaways and conclusions. So the first extreme I want to look at for, for Chris Price's perspective is what if Berkey does take a check, check all route? Um, so we saw this that if Chris is going to be betting too much, uh, then Berkey should take a check all approach. Um, but if Berkey does take a check all approach, how would how should Chris respond to that? Um, so one, if Berkey does take a check all approach, his EV is still pretty high. So it's two hundred twenty seven dollars um, at equilibrium. If he does take a check all approach, then Chris should really simplify by checking all back. And it, it seems simple, but um, that's mainly because then Berkey's still retaining his huge nut advantage and um, hands like King Queen again this goes back to the same point that we made before which is hands like King Queen King Jack King 10 are just not going to fare well at all if uh, they're faced with a, a check raise here and um, you know if they do choose to bet you know Berkey can then check raise um, fairly widely uh, you know in with a combo of value and you know he does have a lot of really good value combos here and a lot of bluffs that either have good blockers um, or uh, you know potential uh, bluff hands uh, he can be mixing in some uh, weaker hands as well in his bluffs as well too and really Chris Price can't do a ton about that and except for just really try to hold on so the check all approach is uh, it seems simple, but um, if Berkey does take a check all approach, really Chris should be checking all of his range back. Now, the second one I want to look at is, well, what if Berkey uh, now checks half of his range? So in this case here, I have Berkey um, checking, uh, I have him checking all of Kings to protect his checking range. Um, and uh, I have him, but then the rest of his value, I have him uh, checking uh, the rest of his value, I have him betting half of it. So half of his ace four suited, um, half of his uh, um, uh, aces, ace kings, half of his kings, half of all of his pairs, and then half of anything with a backdoor flush draw. So um, while checking really his uh, any of his non backdoor flush draw hands, so his ace highs here without a backdoor flush draw, and Berkey's EV is a little higher here, so his EV in this spot here is uh, 233. Um, so we can see that betting betting some of Berkey's range is, is better than checking all of his range. Um, when he does check here in this spot, again, this is, you know, again, very simple for Chris, is uh, Chris should be checking all of his hands back. And, you know, we can start noticing a trend here, and I, I think one of the takeaways that we're starting to see from this is the more that Chris expects... The more that Berkey may retain some of the top end hands in his checking range as traps, Chris needs to be aware of that. And Chris needs to uh, adjust accordingly and err towards checking most of his range back if Berkey's doing that. Um, conversely, then, to say, we can say that if Chris is confident, Chris should be betting his hands. Only really if he's confident that Berkey is is not retaining his uh, his best hands in his check range. So the last one that I want to look at in this spot here is, well, what happens if Berkey is really betting most of his value um, as well as his as his bluffs here? So this is probably uh, it's it's a little bit more of a uh, bet heavy range, although it's still not the betting nearly as much as uh, what the solver prefers that Berkey bets at equilibrium. Um, but he's betting more. He's betting more than half of his range, and the EV is even higher this time, so it's almost $238. And again, what I have Berkey here is um, he's betting all of his value hands, so he's betting aces, ace king in full combos, um, king queen in full combos. I have him betting half of ace four suited um so retaining the other half the one without the backdoor flush draw in his checking range i also have him retaining kings in his checking range so he does retain a couple hands here in his checking range um and then i have him betting all of his backdoor uh flush draws as well too um i have him checking um queen queens and jacks and then i have him betting half of his tens through sixes 
uh, in this spot here, again, more for denial purposes as well, too. So when Berkey does bet more in this spot here, um, through the check route, now Chris can then employ a, ch a bet range again. And this is where uh, King Queen can choose to, to bet a little bit more here in this spot too. So, you know, this again brings back that last point that I just made, which is if Chris is confident that uh, Berkey is betting the majority of his best hands. And when I say best hands, I mean the hands that are better in his range that than the ones in Chris Price's range. So if he's betting his aces, he's betting his ace kings, and he's betting his king queens in full combos, and he's betting most of his ace four suiteds in full combos, even if he has one ace four, one or two ace four suiteds left um, and his pocket kings left, Chris then can start betting on uh, on flops. Um, but if Berkey does not if Berkey retains more of these top end hands, so if he is checking any of his ace kings or aces, um, it's going to put Chris Price in a really tough spot here um, where he should probably be checking a little bit more. Um, in this spot here, if he does bet, um, again, Berkey, uh, um, uh, when Berkey decides to continue through a call, uh, after Berkey checks again, um, Chris Price can then bet again because. Berkey's, most of Berkey's range at this point has been funneling down. One point that Chris made that I thought was really interesting here, which I think is a an astute point, um, but it also highlights something, uh, a potential misstep in his play, was he made a comment on his turn play that he wanted to bet smaller, the bet, betting 325, which was the uh, about 40% pot here, to keep Berkey's range wider. And that's a really good point here because, you know, as you can see, when we get to this spot here, Berkey can get to the turn with, yes, he can get to the turn with some kings in his range, um, but he can also get to the turn with a lot of worse pocket pairs, uh, backdoor hands, ace highs. Um, betting smaller keep tries to keep that, that range wide, and that's true. Uh, the problem then is that when he does get to the river, putting in the large bet that he does, he's really only going to get called by better hands there. And the hands that actually I would worry about um, from Chris Price's perspective are uh, obviously the traps, but then a hand like King Jack is certainly a hand that Berkey could have in his range there in that spot um, if he does choose to play it more through the passive game tree. Uh, that really just sucked out on on Chris Price at the end there too. So, uh, you know, that's you know obviously one combo, and it's not uh, it's not going to be uh, I guess oh sorry two combos of, of King Jack suited there, and it's not going to be um, a significant portion of his range. But I think by the time we get to the river, uh, ranges are going to be so condensed that you're not really targeting. I I don't know necessarily what Chris Price was targeting on the river bet, which is really why I do think his hand functions uh, really, really well as a two street hand, not necessarily as well as, as a three street hand. Um, but overall, really, really, really interesting hand. And um, what I'm finding just going through uh, this in uh, GTO Plus is having the insight of the players and, and talking and, and hearing Berkey and Chris talk through their thought processes um, in the middle of hands um, is really enhancing the way in which I can actually look at um, a hand analysis in a solver, mainly because it's improving the accuracy of my inputs and improving the accuracy of my assumptions uh, as I'm building out the solve. And it's allowing me to test more things too, which is uh, really cool. So I wanna wrap up with a couple key takeaways and uh, just some key takeaways that I've put together here for um, this specific hand. So first, uh, let's look at it from Berkey's perspective. Is um, We saw that Berkey had a slight equity advantage, but he had a significant nut advantage in his range. And as a result, um, he had a really high uh, EV advantage in his, in, um, within his hand. Uh, sorry, within his range. And as a result of that, he can really choose if he wanted to, to bet his entire range. Uh, 
Um, he does not, and and that's fine too, because an ace ten off is 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 absolutely fine to be putting in the checking range. And if we are going to be checking some of the hands in our range, ace ten off was probably one of the um, lower candidates in Berkey's range, uh, and functions really well as as a check as well too. Um, the EV difference of check fold versus check call on the flop for Berkey is is really really close, um, but it does lean check fold. Um, particularly in the one test that we ran um, without a heart. So uh, we can take away from that is that if, if Berkey's really on the cusp of um, deciding whether to continue with his hand or not, um, choosing a hand uh, that does not block Chris Price's backdoor flush draw uh, uh, bluff hands is going to be better than choosing hands that do back, uh, block his backdoor flush draw um, uh, betting hands. The check call on the turn, um, we can deduce that uh, that probably leads to a more significant EV loss in this hand, and that's probably where um, Berkey lost uh, the most money on, on, on this hand, was the decision to check call on the turn. Uh, so the check call on the flop is, is, is fairly negligible um, compared to check fold. Uh, the check call on the turn is, is probably leads more to uh, a significant EV loss. Uh, which is what Berkey really mentioned as well uh, in his analysis um, in the On Second Thought uh, podcast as well, too. Uh, and then finally, um, just kind of looking at Berkey's primary problem set, his primary problem set here is to determine if Chris is over bluffing. So we see if Chris is, has, um, is weighted towards value in his range, um, Berkey has a very clear fold, and it's, um, it turns out really not to be that close. Um, but if Chris is checking back more of some of his King X hands and he is betting all of his back doors, that's when Berkey can start adding in more of his ace high hands um, to continue with on flops and even potentially turns, although turns start getting, again, even a little dicey, even if Chris is over bluffing. Chris, um, on the other hand, so Chris's takeaways, he's at the very top of his range. King Queen is the top hand in his range here. Um, at least on the flop and the turn. Um, however, he's extremely capped. He does not have anything better than King Queen. So as a result, he's going to be um, um, vulnerable if Berkey does retain uh, traps in his hand here. Um, he likely has a two street hand here. Um, he's uh, not going to get value from much worse um, for three streets in this spot. Um, you can potentially say that, that Berkey may hang on with um, some weaker kings here. So, uh, you know, if he does have uh, king 10, king 9 in his range, um, possibly he may be getting value from that. Uh, but that might be a little bit of a stretch to get three streets of value from um, uh, from those hands. So it, it, the hand does play a lot uh, more straightforwardly if he does uh, check one of those streets. And I actually think you can make a really great argument that he should be checking back the flop and the hand plays really simply on turns and rivers then. Um, and then Chris Price's final, um, his primary problem set here is to really just determine if Berkey is retaining enough nut hands in his checking range. So, and those nut hands being uh, pocket kings, ace four suited, um, pocket aces, and ace king. Uh, that's a lot of combos of hands uh, that uh, Chris Price does not have. I mean, that's three combos of kings, two combos of ace four suited, six combos of aces, 12 combos of ace king. Um, all of those hands rank better than every single hand in Chris Price's range. So the more of those that Berkey could retain in his checking range on the flop, uh, the worse shape Chris is going to be in and the harder it's going to be making is it's going to make uh, for uh, Chris Price to be uh, actually betting on um, the flop and the turn here. So, anyways, I uh, hope you enjoyed. I'm going to go back to the, the front here. So I hope you enjoyed. This was a, a hand analysis um, from the Poker Out Loud student edition, um, Berkey versus Price. Um, I really did enjoy uh, going through this analysis and. Uh, uh, looking at uh, both of uh, the hand from both of these two perspectives. Um, if you have any comments or thoughts, uh, you know, leave them in the comments below. 
Um, I'm, I'm planning on doing more of these as the Poker Out Loud uh, season goes along. I think it, the, the format lends itself nicely to uh, some, some deep solver analyses. So, uh, you know, uh, I'll definitely do more of these as I go forward in the future, but uh, we'd love to hear people's thoughts uh, on, you know, both this hand and just the format in general. So, uh, if you have any questions or comments, let me know. Otherwise, uh, thanks for watching.